Uh, so, without further comment, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our five panelists. I'll start on the end with Brent Davies, who's the Vice President of Forests and Ecosystem Services for Ecotrust. Brent, an alum of this school, she reminds me, uh, is Ecotrust Vice President, as I said, for Forests and Ecosystem Services. In this role, she oversees the development and implementation of forest policy, communication, market con connection, watershed restoration, ecosystem service quantification and assessment initiatives. She spent the uh, last two years working with tribes, nonprofits, private landowners, businesses, and government agencies to develop and implement conservation, restoration, and economic development strategies. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next, Mark Wishney is the, yes, uh, actually coming to this end, Mark Wishney is the uh, Director of Global Forestry and Wood Products for the Nature Conservancy. Mark directs, as I, I guess I don't need to repeat that, as it's written here, uh, he manages a portfolio of initiatives aimed at delivering on the climate mitigation potential of forests and the forest economy. Mark joined TNC from the BTG Pactual Timberland Investment Group, where he led portfolio management, research and analytics for the firm's $3 billion global timberland portfolio. And Mark is also among School of BS and Forest Management. Uh, next, Kate Cinnamon uh, is an Associate Professor and Founding Director of the Carbon Leadership Forum at the University of Washington, uh, where she is in the Department of Architecture and a licensed architect and structural engineer. Her research is focused on environmental life cycle assessment, integrated practice, and innovative construction materials and methods. She's founding director of the Carbon Leadership Forum, which is an industry academic collaborative research effort focused on linking LCA to design and construction and practice to advance low carbon construction. Dan, executive policy advisor for the Department of Natural Resources in Washington, focusing on climate resilience and carbon sequestration. In his role, he's identifying risks and responses related to climate change on DNR's forest, aquatic, agricultural, and rangeland operations. And he's leading efforts to advance carbon management across DNR managed lands and waters. He previously worked with the National Wildlife Federation and as their environmental policy specialist for the Pacific region and as a co author of Washington's Integrated Climate Change Response Strategy. And last but not least, Bonnie Lay is project manager for Microsoft's AI for Earth program. She leads its strategic partnerships and grants program, which empower researchers and innovators to leverage artificial intelligence technology for environmental solutions in the areas of climate, water, agriculture, and biodiversity conservation. Previously, she traveled the globe as an environmental scientist and conservationist. She helped start the marine program at the Wildlife Conservation Society in Myanmar, discovered a new sea slug species in the Caribbean, <laughs> and researched climate adaptation and endangered penguins in South Africa. She has degrees in biology and economics and business from Harvard and Chinhua universities, and is based in Seattle, where she serves on the Urban Forestry Commission and has been recognized as a National Geographic Explorer for her work in environmental Thanks, and uh, please join me in thanking you all the panelists as well. Okay, so the, the goal of the two questions I have is to try to get us started in learning. Sorry, I can very ask a few questions on how I do. Um, learning what you guys are all doing. All right, so the, the basic question is, what carbon-related type projects is your organization, organization involved in um, that you want to share with us? And see if we can sort of divide up that time. I don't really care who starts, but we'll try to make sure we hear from everybody. Then I'll have a follow-up question to that, and then you might have some questions. Okay, so I don't know who would like to start. I guess I can. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, uh, thanks, Greg. Um, morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I uh, run the Global Forest and Wood Products Program at the Nature Conservancy, which is uh, uh, one of the, the big global environmental NGOs. 
So um, the, the range of programs and projects that the nature contingency is involved in is, is large. We have 4,000 staff, about 600 scientific staff. Um, we have offices in every in chapters in every U.S. state and in 72 countries around the world. So it's a, it's a pretty broad range. But uh, um, uh, at, a, at, a, at the global level, the team and the program that I run, um, our work is focused primarily on delivering on, on climate climate mitigation potential for forest and broader forest economy. So climate isn't the only thing that we're concerned about in the global forest program, but um, but it is our primary objective. And, uh, and that's because of the urgency of the challenge and because of the difficulty uh, that there always is in delivering on, uh, uh, on any one um, uh, objective as large as trying to address climate. Our approach um, to, uh, to this challenge is based in, in science and based in sort of the existing research um, that shows that the land sector, uh, the forests, wetlands, grasslands, has the potential to contribute perhaps a third of the climate mitigation necessary under the Paris Agreement. Depending on the numbers you, you look at and what assumptions you make about how much land is available for what, the numbers can be much higher and much lower. But um, when you look at the existing data, it's clear that whatever the numbers are, um, first, if we don't find a way to deliver in a much more significant way on the potential of the land sector, then even if we get everything else right, we're still not going to have a climate stable future. We still won't hit our targets. So, unfortunately, as we like to say on our team, um, it's not as if we have a lot of great uh, options on the table for how to address climate change. We're just picking our favorite three. We have a few lousy options, and even if we knock them all out of the park, we still wouldn't get where we need to be. So, we need to work on all the hard ones also. Um, and anything that, is, that involves land use change at a scale significant enough to make a difference for climate is big and hard. Um, but when you look at the data, it's clear that the biggest opportunities are around forests. And um, roughly speaking, about half of the total biophysical potential of improved land management comes from reforestation. Another third, roughly, would come from uh, stopping deforestation and improving the way that we manage uh, our existing forests. So that's where we focus most of our effort, but that's really just on the supply side, that's on the sequestration side, that's on what happens out in the forest. And we know that what drives what happens on landscapes is, is largely driven by economics and social factors. Uh, and so we also, uh, we sort of split our efforts between supply side work, trying to work in places around the world where there's potential to increase forest cover or help to protect and slow the loss of the forest that we have. Um, uh, we also focus sort of an equal effort in trying to build and support markets and demand signals that will drive the kinds of outcomes on landscapes that we want to see. So demand for uh, wood products and forest products that confer climate benefits and that can be responsibly sourced and that, that by their sourcing can either uh, uh, maintain, uh, help to maintain forests or guide a forest or even incentivize investment in new forests. Um, and and uh, uh, work on supply chains and other sort of intermediate components that are necessary to make those systems fit together. So um, I'll stop there because that was probably too long. Hi, thank you. So I'm, uh, I came to the University of Washington after over 15 years of practicing as an architect and structural engineer. And, uh, it, it, and at that time, we were really learning how to make zero energy buildings, so buildings that didn't consume energy, they generated more than they used. And as we started to develop these new technologies, I, I started and others started to ask the question, uh, what about the materials that go into the building? So while we made good strides at reducing, at uh, being able to reduce the impacts of operating buildings, really the new frontier in the building design and construction is understanding emissions from making and building buildings. Those upfront emissions happen right before you turn on the lights and uh, if we look at buildings built between now and 2050, so a new building built today in Seattle, more than half of its impacts will be related to manufacturing materials that go into it. Yet currently in practice, rarely are those embodied emissions considered in design decisions. The Carbon Leadership Forum was founded about 10 years ago. It has grown to be what is arguably the largest group of interdisciplinary architects, owners, <coughs> material manufacturers, builders, policy makers, who are focused on understanding these emissions and setting up systems in place so that we can rapidly transform and drive to an economy that values carbon storing and low carbon manufacturing. Um, so I'm all carbon. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, probably 
probably the big, for this audience, I would say the two most interesting things that we're looking at. Uh, one, um, well, let's see. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna just talk a little more. There's, um, there's three ways in which you can reduce the body carbon in a building. You could not build a building. You could build a smaller building, you could reuse an existing building. Really clear, you don't have to analyze too much to know that you're gonna have less impact if you keep something. The next one is deciding between systems. So this is, should I build a cross laminated timber building or a concrete building? Should I make my walls out of straw bale or metal studs? And when you look at those system-based decisions, you have to take a comprehensive life cycle approach because things can perform differently. CLT performs differently than concrete, acoustically, fire, all sorts of other things. They are not necessarily the same thing. And so you have to look at a full life cycle. And then the third way of choosing is within uh, product and, and making a low carbon choice of like things. Do I pick the lower carbon wood? Can I pick the lower carbon rebar steel? Newcore Steel here in Seattle provides the lowest carbon rebar except for rebar coming out of Norway because we have a low carbon electricity grid and a very efficient plant. Uh, can those manufacturers get incentivized and rewarded for their low carbon conditions, even if it's accidental today, like, <laughs> um, so that other people have the confidence to invest in the large scale of manufacturing practices that needed to bring out really new carbon, low carbon innovations that are possible across materials. In the build, in the wood, um, wood has a promise of really exciting um, car carbon solution in the building sector that we're storing carbon in wood, where all these great opportunities available. Um, but um, as Mark was pointing out, it, you, there's some sort of slippery stuff. If we just make, make all of our wood here in Washington State with um, sustainable wood um, managed from Washington forests, which are arguably the best I've been told in the area, uh, then um, uh, will it all displace um, and start new forest practices in Siberia or something like that? Uh, and so the, um, when we're looking to choose between products in a specific category, it's really hard for um, building um, industry professionals to find that data and make choices right now. So a recent project that is um, getting support from Microsoft uh, is the Body Carbon and Construction Calculator. And in that project, we're amassing data uh, from environmental product declarations. So that's embodied carbon results from life cycle assessments reported by manufacturers. And, and, letting, and helping people evaluate them. Wood is hard, wood is messy. And um, you know, when people either resort to the simple solution, it's like wood is carbon negative, um, and, and so we should just pile wood. So in that argument, <coughs> you have a better building if you just waste wood and stack it all up. Because the more wood you have everywhere in your building, you have a more negative building, and that can't be the right solution. And then the other answer is, um, Woods are natural places and we should never cut them down and they have more potential to store carbon in them and so we should never cut forest products and all forest products are bad. So but along in that spectrum, there's got to be somewhere in the middle about how can we value carbon smart method, forestry practices. How can we recognize the fact that the carbon emissions from wood products today don't include the biogenic carbon emissions and if you include them, they kind of look worse than steel and concrete. And if I'm really worried about between now and 2050, should I be including those carbon emissions? Because they are carbon emissions. And it takes a while for the trees to grow back. And I, I'm confused. And I spend a lot of time on this. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm, so I'm not totally confused. I'm just saying that this is, this is um, how the building sector gets to. And they get, um, we need more research about connecting forest practices to forest products so that people can have confidence in that they're purchasing, they're making smart purchases. Awesome. Hello, everyone. So I'm very excited to be here to chat with all of you a little bit today. Um, and I think from Microsoft's point of view, we think about environmental sustainability as a program um, in sort of two main ways. Like number one, as a company, how can Microsoft think about its own environmental impact, its operations, its buildings, et cetera, et cetera, and how can we try to minimize and then mitigate that impact as much as possible. Um, but on the other hand, also thinking about the fact that Microsoft is a company that has um, a wealth of technical information and knowledge. And so how can we try to apply that technical innovation towards solving problems in the environmental space as well? And so that's sort of like the, the way that you think of how our program runs. There's this one side that's really focused on operational sustainability. 
And so from that, you need to think about, again, what the impacts are, measure that, and offset that as much as possible. And since 2012, Microsoft has been completely carbon neutral. Um, and part of that has been achieved by an implementation of an internal carbon tax. And in uh, April of this year, that tax actually has been raised. So it's about $15 per metric ton. And this tax is attributed to every single business group within Microsoft. And so for me, it's even if I, if I take a plane trip for a business, um, for a business reason, that the cost, the carbon um, in that plane flight is actually charged to my business group. And at the end of the year, each one of these business groups needs to roll that information into this entire, in this internal environmental fee. And so what do we actually use that fee for? Part of it is trying to move the company towards renewable, um, a renewable electricity, renewables overall, and renewable energy. Um, another part of it is for the, the, the bits uh, that we cannot reduce and that we cannot replace with, um, with renewables, how can we actually offset that? And so we invest in a number of different carbon offset projects around the world. And finally, uh, as of two years ago, we started a program called AI for Earth, which is what I work for. Um, and so the internal carbon tax actually funds this internal innovation program. And AI for Earth is completely focused on how can we take the latest machine learning innovations um, being developed within Microsoft as well as outside by other researchers and apply them directly to environmental data sets and environmental challenges. And we work across four different focus areas of agriculture, climate, biodiversity, um, and freshwater. And across those areas, we've now funded more than 425 projects with impact in more than 70 countries around the world. Uh, and I'm super excited. I think later on in the panel, I'll actually talk about one of my favorite examples um, of one of these projects that we've supported with a direct, um, with a direct impact on um, some of the forestry, carbon markets that we're talking a, a bit about today. Um, but I think as a general comment, um, as you heard from my bio, I previously used to get to track around jungles quite literally, and it was a ton of fun, and I got to work on conservation issues directly on the ground, and some people are very confused about why I choose to sit in a large technology company nowadays in fluorescent lighting, uh, but I think part of it is because I really do believe that this application of technology, this application of technology at scale really does give us an ability to try to address these accelerating environmental issues we're facing. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So I'm Dan Seaman, um, and I work with the Department of Natural Resources. And um, if you notice my bio, um, I, I started off really focusing in on uh, climate adaptation. Uh, and so uh, carbon sequestration is somewhat new to me, uh, which in some ways is a hindrance and in some ways is a benefit because I have a lot of questions and I don't have a lot of baggage behind me. So um, what I'm trying to do is sort of figure out what the truth is because I have a very clear goal, which is reducing uh, carbon out of the, uh, out of the atmosphere. And so uh, that is what I think is sort of the ultimate goal here through, uh, through forest management in this case. Uh, let me give you an overview of what DNR does. Um, DNR, uh, as you probably know it from its forest management, but it actually also manages a lot of ag and rangeland. We manage the uh, state-owned aquatic lands. Um, we do a lot of solar leasing. Uh, we have the, uh, the state's uh, uh, Washington uh, Geological Survey. Um, and uh, we also do wildfire management uh, across most of the uh, uh, forested lands. And so it's, it's a pretty broad agency doing a lot of different things, and we're interested in figuring out how to manage carbon across all those lands, not just the forest lands. Um, one of the things that we've done so far is we've initiated a, a, a forest ecosystem uh, carbon inventory, working with U.S. Forest Service um, and the, the folks that manage their uh, FIA uh, projects, and so. Um, this is an attempt to get a handle on what's actually going on on the landscape in terms of carbon management. So if you're familiar with the FIA data, it's plot data, um, approximately uh, 6,000 acres every plot in a grid format, um, totally random. 
Um, and they do, they direct measure uh, once every 10 years. They do 10% of the plots every year. And so there's this rolling kind of uh, process. And so it, what they've got now is a full measurement. And then in Washington State, about 50% of the plots re measured. And so this data is not, wasn't intentionally, was not uh, initially designed for carbon, but because of what they collect, you can figure out the carbon path, uh, uh, topics as well. And so uh, initially, California contracted with these folks to, to do this work. Oregon has as well, and Washington also. And so um, Oregon's uh, work will be published probably in the next couple of weeks. California is, is already out, and ours will probably be out in about a month and a half or two. Um, and what that will do is give us a co comprehensive picture across the entire West Coast states of uh, carbon dynamics on the landscape, uh, looking at both stocks and flux and trends. And um, so that's one of the things that DNR is doing to try to get a handle on what is happening uh, on the landscape with regard to forest carbon. This is just forest carbon in this case. Um, what we also realize is that's not the entire picture. And so we also uh, initiated, well, we, we got a, a, some legislation passed the last legislative session to do uh, some other carbon inventories related to harvested wood products um, and uh, sawmill energy use. And that is also using this, uh, the same researchers and a, a, and a consistent process that was used by California and Oregon. So we're going to have consistent information on that as well. Um, and then also wildfire emissions and, uh, and uh, land use, land management changes, looking at how to project forward. So those are some of, the, some of the things that we're going to be doing over the next year and a half or so. It will hopefully give us a better handle on what is actually happening on the landscape. And, Part of the reason for this is that, as, I've, as I said, I'm new to this, and so I've been talking with uh, my, my compatriots in uh, California and Oregon, and I've seen how in those contexts, and a little bit here in Washington as well, but not nearly as bad, um, a lot of, there's a lot of um, interest groups around forest carbon and carbon management and climate change, as there should be. Um, but they often argue based on their own perspectives of what they think the world looks like as opposed to working from the data that tells them what it is. And so my hope, and it's only a hope, I can't guarantee this is going to happen, uh, is that we can uh, have discussions about the, uh, about the data and what the data means as opposed to just pretending we know how the carbon is behaving on the landscape. Um, so the data that we're coming out with uh, soon will you know, uh, differentiate between uh, different regions, different species, uh, different ownerships, uh, and so it will be able to give us a sense um, at a somewhat poor scale about what's going on in the landscape. Um, so that's one of the things, or one set of things that we are doing. Um, I'd also sort of highlight some of the uh, sort of Sort of supporting mechanisms that we're working within. And so one of those is the US Climate Alliance. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, when the federal government uh, uh, stated that it was going to pull out of the Paris Accords, a number of governors, including Governor Inslee here in Washington, got together and said, well, if the feds aren't going to do it, we will ourselves. And so they banded together, and there's now, I think, 26 states that have committed to meeting the Paris Accords uh, at a state by state level. And they've set, they've got money from Pew and others, and they've set up a number of uh, working groups, one of them being National Working Lands, which focuses in on how to support the states in understanding how to uh, essentially do carbon accounting well. And so it's basically a, a capacity building, information sharing, and, and support uh, for that. And so that's one of the things that we're working with as well uh, on that score. Uh, a second thing that another supporting mechanism is uh, a forest carbon, the forest MOU that was signed by my boss, Hilary Franz, uh, Commissioner of Public Lands for DNR, um, and then also folks in California and British Columbia. And that MOU basically says we're going to share and explore information around carbon and climate change impacts. Um, uh, across a number of different topics, and a number of them focus in on things like carbon management, <clears throat> carbon inventory and accounting, 
um, and other sort of uh, forest issues around climate change, you know, sort of uh, how to deal with reforestation, <coughs> excuse me, um, and other things like what species to plant and stuff. So we're trying to learn from each other, essentially. Um, and then a, a third thing that I'll just note, because it just happened uh, last week, uh, was that, as I mentioned, the three states, California, Oregon, and Washington, are um, uh, doing this same carbon inventory work. And so we got together with the U.S. Forest Service folks uh, in Portland for a, uh, a workshop. And some of the folks here in this room were at that workshop as well. Um, and uh, the first day was focused on the inventory and how we, what we can learn across the three states from the various ways that it worked. And then the remaining three days were really about developing a research uh, program for U.S. Forest Service around carbon. And uh, so that's really nice to just see that they're actually moving towards that as well. One of the, the messages that I've given within DNR is that, and I think this is great that you, know, you all are thinking about this as, as well here at UW, because my personal opinion is that for DNR, and probably for all of us, this is a whole new line of business. Uh, and this is a line of business that is, we are sort of building right now and will be for our future indefinitely. Um, and we need to figure out how to do that well and, uh, and and have good foundations around which to build decisions. And so I'm really excited that you guys are thinking about this. We certainly are too, and I look forward to working with you on as we go forward. So thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Brent, and I'm really excited to, to be here. It's um, been a few years since I've had a chance to, to come back, and we were, Mark and I were walking here this morning, and I thought, are we going to find Anderson Hall in the middle of all these new buildings? And we got here, and I was like, I remember this room. But you changed the chairs. The chairs used to be wood. And someone just told me you just got rid of them. Anyway, it's really fun to be back here, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm a pretty good trust, as Greg said, and uh, we're a public benefit organization that works in an area we call Salmon Nation from Alaska to Northern California, where the salmon are. We're really inspired by nature. We're working um, on projects for both people and place. Uh, uh, we have a forest ecosystem services program, uh, food and farms, and fisheries. We have a knowledge systems group, which is probably our largest team of scientists and cartographers, GIS analysts, and economists, and uh, those kind of folks. And then we also have a native um, yeah, program, native uh, uh, indigenous peoples program. We work, we've worked a long time and um, have deep relationships in Indian country. And as Greg said, I'm in the Forest and Ecosystem Services program, and my colleague David Diaz is here, so he's part-time with you all and part-time with us. And so we were really um, excited to have that partnership. And last year, we published a, a paper together on this very topic. And it's been super helpful. I brought a, a copy of the summary of, of that. Um, but in, in general, so let's see what we're focused on within the world of, of carbon is really trying to better understand what we've got. So this is the stock issue. So what's the baseline? Where are we in terms of carbon on different, within different ecoregions in the Pacific Northwest? And then on different land ownership types. So, so what does it look like now? And what would it look like under different management scenarios? So if our goal is to increase carbon sequestration and storage on our, within our forests, we know these forests, of the, the temperate forests in particular, are so incredible globally. Yeah, this, we, we live in this really special place. Our, our forests are um, very important, um, arguably the best in the world at, at, at this um, process of sequestering and storing carbon. And so how can we um, work on doing more of that uh, under our, our given uh, climate situation? So if we're going to do that, we're going to ask landowners to leave more uh, room, more, more trees, more forests uh, for, for salmon, for steep slopes, for owls, for drinking water. 80% of Oregonians and Washingtonians get our drinking water from forests. So how can we incent landowners to uh, 
sequester and store more carbon. We need more forests standing and let them do their thing. And so we're really trying to figure out the policies that will work and send these different classes of landowners, whether it's tribal communities, small uh, family forest landowners, uh, other private landowners, and, and support the public forests, which we have a lot of here. So how can we support the good work that they are doing? Um, and so those are some of the things. So within that, that's policy and some communications and getting the word out that this is the kind of thing that we support and want to see more of. Okay, thank, thank you all so much. That was excellent. Um, we invite you here to do just what you've done, sort of get us thinking in multiple ways about this question, and that's, that's sort of the heart of what the workshop's going to do. Um, as we move on. What I thought maybe is we would ask for questions from the audience because I'd be really curious what you'd like to hear them talk about and then I can try to bring them to mic and see if we can work that out without actually getting hurt. Uh, I'm defended in this room. I never used a microphone before. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I'm uh, one of the things uh, after hearing from you, it's obvious we are doing a terrible job of communicating some of our research, especially Kate and I work on multiple projects, and the the idea that we are waiting for 40 years for the carbon to sequester is not the concept of sustainable forestry. We sequester every year, the extraction and sequestration happen simultaneously. But the failure is out. We haven't uh, uh, communicated that properly. Most probably that's why the confusion remains. I, I grew up in India, I always heard that my granddad lived for 100 years and he always smoked, so smoking doesn't kill. And that whole confusion made me smoke for 15 years. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to hear from, uh, from my, uh, our NGO partners uh, that how these, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, lack of clarity on climate change and role of wood or uh, embodied carbon and all these things, how it's impacting the constituents you guys talked to in their, in their adoption of uh, climate-friendly technology. Is it a huge impediment or is something where we can work better to help the overall community to understand and take uh, steps? Well, I think if I think I um, understood you correctly, Indra, it's, it's a um, it's a huge discussion. It's a huge distraction. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, just this week, I have a a thread that I'm on with a colleague from one of our um, one of our partners in a, in a more activist organization, and one that's not so activist, and it's back and forth and back and forth. And I'm it's really tiring and distracting. And I really do. Um, look forward to the day when we settle some of these questions. It's sort of like, we don't have time for that. You know, there's there's more pressing things to get done. And um, so that is one of the things on my list for, for all of you. Let's do our best at settling some of this. It's, there will always be science that, uh, science that, you know, promotes your opinion. But to the extent that we can, um, have the bulk, you know, the body of the science. For example, I mean, climate change, like it's, we know, right? That's settled, right? So let's settle some of this other stuff. And it's it's around it's around carbon, it's frankly around thinning and fire and a lot of other issues that even amongst our colleagues in the conservation community, they they would be arguing too much. And it's um, time to move on. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, that's a great question, and I was just comment um, on for, I mentioned that Microsoft actually purchases carbon offsets, um, and for a program to actually be able to be recognized as like a Red Plus, plus certification, or to be formally you know, be able to sell carbon offsets on their land, this is a process that takes years on years on years, and there's intensive monitoring um, uh, processes that need to be undertaken. 
And that was something that for us, you know, like we part, partly about, you know, like getting some of these local smallholder landowners and forest owners to actually be able to participate in the carbon market and see the value directly in keeping their forest stand standing was something that we wanted to see if there was a way we could incentivize. Um, and so we were working through the Hand for Earth program with a nonprofit with a small startup called Sylvia Terra. And they were using technology that was super cool. They managed to create these algorithms that managed to generate the first map of every single tree down to its species and to its size completely automatically by training this machine learning algorithm on some FIA data amongst others. Um, and so now essentially from any satellite imagery across um, the country, they're able to generate a real-time map um, of every single damn tree, which is super cool. And that's the sort of data that has a ton of different applications and uses, including like tracking, you know, deforestation um, and changes in land use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the things we work with them on specifically is how could we use this much better, easier, cheaper monitoring method that now is developed and apply that towards the carbon offset market. Um, and so we partnered with the Nature Conservancy with Sylvia Terra on helping them actually get small landowners in Pennsylvania to use this technology to be able to monitor the, the carbon value of keeping their forest standing for one year, calculate the amount of credits that would actually generate. Microsoft is now the first, would be the first purchasers of those credits, and it would then allow those landowners to be able to get a financial incentive, again, to keep those trees standing for just one year. And that was like a super interesting experiment because we were curious, like, will these landowners actually care? Would they be interested in participating? Um, and we actually had one guy, um, which based on the calculations, it would only be a $250 contribution for him to keep, you know, like he was only cutting some trees for firewood, but you know, that was enough. He was so excited about the program, about keeping his forest standing, and that was enough of a contribution for him to do that. So we're hoping to see additional levers like that that could be put in the system so that you could take technology, take the research that's happening, and turn it into real work on the ground. Uh, so I, I also reiterate Brent's point of view. Um, I'm, I, I pitch myself as sort of a neutral Switzerland of embodied carbon, and the forestry stuff is exhausting. Um, and uh, it, it, um, it, there's, it, in order to communicate well, things get simplified, and then all you have to do is think a little bit, and you know that it's not that simple. And so it. Um, uh, and when you start digging into it, you find what appears to be long-held personal conflicts where um, that, that maybe an independent perspective might be good because um, it's hard to interpret, it's a hard, hard, hard to interpret um, the data when it seems personal as opposed to, uh, or emotional as opposed to just this is what it is. So um, it's clear that Forests can be cut and harvested simultaneously so we can treat them as neutral. But it's also clear that some forest practices are different than others. And therefore, as, as people trying to make decisions about which products are better than another, we need a really rigorous connection between all of those sorts of things. And simplification like soil carbon is neutral is hard when somebody else says, no, it can't be, to say, how can I interpret that? So I do think that kind of trying to come to some, maybe uh, accepting ways of reporting uncertainty, so rather than simplifying assumptions so much, uh, report the range of possible solutions based on the data that we know. Some, something that acknowledges that there is some unknowns, but we still can make take action. Um, I'll, I'll pitch in also, although I imagine Andrew could not have been directing that question at me because he's heard me bang on about this <laughs> often in the past. But just to add my, uh, my couple of cents, um, I think, uh, I mean, thanks for the question, Andrew, and, and thanks for the conversation. In, in, in my view of the question of how we maximize the carbon mitigation potential of the forest economy, this is the central question, the, the issues that have been coming up here. Um, uh, Forests are complicated. It's even more complicated than forest practices vary because it, 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 at, a, at a local level, you, we all want to ensure sort of basic level of sustainability, but the issue isn't so much what's happening in this particular stand. Um, 
Um, the question is, what's happening in this market? You know, I might treat this fan well, but even at a local level, that might affect how the next fan is harvested. Um, or that, that marginal change in demand shifts then how forests in this region are managed. And so, you know, it's certainly true at the local level, as soon as you cut down a tree, you have a you have carbon emission, and that's another level of complexity, is that the scale that you assess this stuff matters, right? And you come to very different conclusions if you look at the stand, or you look at the watershed, or you look at the state, or you look at the world. Um, and uh, so it all becomes really complicated and really hard. And to the case point, it makes it really hard for anyone to make a decision, particularly if this is not your field, right? Um, if you're an architect or an engineer or who's specking a building, or you're a policymaker who's trying to decide, should I uh, you know, try and favor uh, uh, some change in material use in construction in my city, right? Um, how do you make those decisions? But again, we don't have a choice. We have to confront these issues. And I think that this is a place where um, the environment community and academia in particular have a really important role to play. Um, and that is that we do need to get together on some straight facts. And I think that, um, that doing some additional research, uh, doing that together, um, and uh, to the extent possible, if, if sort of some leaders in the environment community can agree on uh, a set of, of approaches or methods for trying to link product use to what's happening in the forest. Um, that, that would actually be a really, really valuable contribution. Not everyone will ever agree, but if we can get sort of a core to agree on, on, on an approach that can be iterative and, and adjusted over time, I think that would be really valuable. I think academia has a huge role to play here in, again, playing sort of neutral arbiter role and helping to provide facts. When we think about what it took to drive the increased use of renewable energy in Europe, we knew how to make solar panels and, and, and windmills in, you know, this, in windmills for a long time, solar panels in the, in the 40s. Um, but it wasn't until policymakers took action because the environment community and the scientific community were saying we need more renewable energy to have a climate stable future that's a public good, policymakers should favor this industry, um, then renewable energy took off. People who made solar panels have been trying to sell as many of those as they could for as long as they've been in business. But policymakers are not able to make a decision about, hey, we need to consume more wood today, or hey, we need to uh, have lower embodied steel, embodied carbon steel and concrete because there aren't tools that allow them to understand what that means. And there's not the social license, particularly in the forest community, around or in the, in, or in the public mind around the forest sector, around using more forest products, even in the context of sustainability and climate positive outcomes. I'll just share one last fact there, which um, the North American Forest Partnership, which is like a big multi-stakeholder North American sort of, uh, communications effort, um, in 2017, they did a survey of 1,500 uh, environmentally aware adults in North America. Um, more than three quarters of all respondents identified wood as the most renewable material if given the choice between wood, concrete, steel, uh, plastic. Um, but no more than 16% of respondents associated any of the following terms with the forest sector. Socially responsible, innovative, good stewards. And that gap between the perception of a product which is renewable, renewable and the perception of the industry that is the source of that product, that gap is that, that gap is the gap of social license. And until that gap is, is, is bridged, there's not really going to be the social license for the rapid scale up of even the most climate positive and most sustainable for products. So is that yeah. Yeah. thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'll weigh in on this as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of layers to that question. Um, one of the, I think one of the key questions is trust. In the, so there's, in the sense that um, can, can the public trust that what is being done in the landscape is actually enhancing carbon or making a change, sort of creating additionality essentially in our, in our usual parlance, right? Because the trees are just there, so what are we doing differently? And the, 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 I would say that the public probably doesn't know that. I would also say that there's a lot of key policymakers who don't know or trust that. Um, and so that sense of understanding the mechanisms and why they should trust that we're doing something different and better uh, is, is a critical hunt to get over. And it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, stories on climate change, because this is what I, you know, I do adaptation, right? And so I remember, you know, 10 years ago, we just used to talk about climate change as this kind of 
blanket, climate change is happening. And what you see now is the drilling down, and it was sort of too amorphous and too kind of uh, too big to sort of get your hands on, so it didn't really like, you didn't feel it directly. But now, just today in the newspaper, in the Seattle Times, it's like how much it's going to cost for health. Uh, like how, you know, it's like drilling down to the coasts, to drought, to health impacts, to the very specifics. And if you get tangible, you can start feeling and making, you can make, you, you get it and in a way that climate change it was never very uh, tangible and so very, not very, uh, people didn't grab onto it very well. But now we've got this sort of, uh, the, the, the robustness around sort of those things. And I think you need to get that way around carbon as well and, and around carbon management in the forests. I'll also just offer, you know, I really appreciated Kate's um, sort of story about the sort of going to the to the edge, to the extremes of like, you know, it doesn't make sense to cut all the forest down and put it in the trees. It doesn't make sense to um, to cut no no forest down. And that means that there is some place in between that is optimal. But I'm not sure we know yet what that is. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of the challenge. And so this question of do we know enough yet is, I think, well, I, I personally don't yet. Um, that's all I can certainly say. Um, and, but I, I would say that within DNR, uh, we struggle with that as well. And I'll just give you one little uh, uh, story of, um, you know, planting trees, like, you know, we did a harvest, um, and then after a harvest, we replant um, those trees. Uh, and and, one, and so one, of the, one of the big questions here is, should we have longer rotations, all right? That's sort of a strategy. It's often considered a very good strategy. Well, there's this fire risk that goes on. Um, and so how do you factor that in? So the story is about an, an area uh, of the North Cascades where we, did a harvest, and then we replanted it, and then for 12 years, and then it burned up. Um, and so then we replanted again, and then there was a drought, and it all died. And you know what? We didn't replant. Um, and so uh, these are. This is something that we need to. So like you know, this is just the reality on the ground. Um, and what we've realized is that the, the conditions are changing. We've actually done an analysis of of DNR. Lands, and we found that uh, on the east side, which is you know, drier, so that nearly as productive as the west side, but you know, only about 25% of our lands can support the full range of silvicultural treatments and still make a profit, which is what we're supposed to do for because we manage these lands in trust for trust beneficiaries. The rest of them, we can maybe do one like a, a free commercial thin or uh, or just a harvest, or in some cases, one, once we uh, once they're taken out either by harvest or fire, they will not grow back. And so this is the changing conditions that we need to be dealing with, and it's unclear exactly how to factor that into this carbon discussion. So I'll leave that. On the trust question, I, I just wanted to add, I think that um, it gets to this to the issue of are we trying is the goal to maximize carbon, or is it to optimize? What are, what are we doing? What are the trade-offs? What are we balancing? Because if, if, if our goal is to just maximize carbon sequestration, would we just plant like bamboo or maybe poplar or something else all over the place? What will that do to our songbirds and our salmon and our really awesome hiking trails and our drinking water? So I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. But what's that? Uh, optimization and those co-benefits that people really care about and if we want to raise that trust level these co-benefits these other ecosystem services maybe you guys can work on finding new terms for all that <laughs> public water drinking water anyway those are some, yeah i don't think we want to plant bamboo all over the place Okay, so I have the task that I don't really want. I mean, I, I sort of let us roll with what we have because I really, really appreciated those comments and they addressed what we're trying to get to. I'm, I'm going to say just a couple of things by way of summary that hopefully will help us think more about process. All right, so you know, we invited the panel here 
as um, a, an outside group of thinkers that could check on the work that we've been doing. I mean, it, it should be known, and it, it was kind of remarkable for some of us to discover each other, I think, being, you know, Sharon Stanton's here with the Forest Service, and they were working on this gigantic co-production of, of, of carbon, um, and I knew nothing about that. I don't think they knew anything about the UW work, nor did anybody know anything about the work going on at the University of Oregon. All right, and I think we all discovered each other within the last four or five weeks. So, you know, just within that relatively kind of tight realm of people that should know what's going on, there, there's a lot happening. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say is we've invited a, a broader group of thinkers to be in, working with us today to try to expand our scopes of work to help us think maybe differently or more completely about a number of projects. And so you know, there, there's a hope that we, we had a lot of forest conversation. All right? we, we didn't really deal as much, by the way, that's my, that's my thing, right? So I'm, I'm totally into it, right? But you know, there are these other aspects that are sort of uh, integrated with that, what's happening in the rangelands, what's happening on the agricultural lands, what's happening in the cities, what's happening in the near shore, you know, the, the, the all the riparian areas that we're not thinking about as much, they're all part of it as well. How does it relate to architecture um, and how we're building buildings, not only how our, our materials moving in, out of forest into building materials, all right? So with that, I, I want us to thank the panelists and know that those of us staying for the workshop will will sort of be here. I didn't say this before, the bathrooms are on this floor. All right, so feel free to, to take those. This is another example of why we're using a mic. This happens here a lot, not, not sirens, but the idea that all of a sudden there's a noise that stops some of us from hearing, all right, in this kind of room. So that some of you can hear no problem all the time, but some of us have bigger challenges in that regard. Um, so when we speak, we're gonna to try to use a mic to do that. All right, so I will invite um, all of you to take a little bit of break, those that are intending to stay for the workshop. Um, we will be reorganizing the tables, so it's going to be a little bit of chaos. Um, and then we'll pull it all back together and form them into groups. Okay, so let's thank our panelists.